Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Shvius chapter 10, Halacha 4, and this is the final shear in the series for Shvius. Now, whenever they end a Yershami, usually it's going to end with something agotic. Now, this is not going to look agotic in the beginning, but it is. So it's going to end with repayments of debts. And what is the biggest repayment of debt? Well, you have a special promise for all of the Jews who keep Torah and mitzvot, who are trying to perfect themselves, who are trying to get closer to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and for that reward of learning Torah so you know the Torah and mitzvot and actively trying to bring that light into yourself and into your soul, that is going to get you to climb up the entire creation to become so refined that you are you are getting very, very close to the the perfect ideal of what a human being is supposed to be and do. Now, we know that after the fall of Gan Eden, that humanity descended and declined and became coarse and became more material. And in fact, really what was happening was that as people started to look uh, at other things other than a Kodesh Baruch Hu, what was happening is they were they were descending, they were becoming more coarse and more material, and there was less spirituality and less soul, and they were getting further away. And that is why God sometimes see, seems to be concealed, that there's concealment, because the more you move away from the original source of creation, and the more your ideas and your thinking moves away from that, and you go toward other things like perversion and other ideologies and other religions, then the ability to really see a Kodesh Baruch Hu, it becomes more and more hard to see. It becomes more and more concealed. And that's because you are moving away from it. Now, there is a great reward held up for the people who are going to learn Torah and the people who are going to do Torah and Mitzvot. The idea of every mitzvah in the Torah is that it turns on a light and every sin creates darkness and really what's happening is that in your life when you're making decisions and you're doing things what you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be doing the Torah and mitzvot because it brings more light and it elevates you and the more you do averot and sins the further you get away from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. and what happens is you end up getting less divine providence shining on you. And, you know, measure for measure, in the Garden of Eden, you had the snake and you had the tree. And the snake, when he was talking to Eve, was saying, look, there's another power source. There's another power other than Hashem. And when they ate from the tree, measure for measure, they were put into a world where they would see that, and the challenge of life would be to see that there is only one power source in the universe, that's a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And it's going to look like there are other power sources, because with that poison and that tuma that entered, in, entered into humanity uh, with the sin, it's going to make it look like Hashem is more concealed. And that is a degradation as we became less refined from our original creation of Adam and Hava. We descended. And as we descend and we get further from the original creation, we, we end up having more concealment of God. In other words, our perception, there's this like opaque curtain of materiality. And it becomes harder and harder to see. And that is why the highest form is going to be what these 36 hidden Sadiqim are able to do. What they're able to do is they're able to see the heavens 
and the workings of the heavens and a Kodesh Baruch Hu, as clearly as when the Jews and the elders of the Jews were leaving Mitzrayim at that point. And there are always 36 hidden Sadiqim Jews who are doing that, who are able to see with that kind of clarity how everything fits together, that there is only one power source, that there is an old Mulvado, and that God keeps his word, that God gave the Torah and mitzvot because humanity descended so much and that he needed to have a chosen people who would come and bring back the humanity back to this level of how things are supposed to be where people are supposed to be more spiritual and to the ideal creation of what a person is supposed to be, which is going to be Adam HaRishon, that is going to be the ideal before the sin. And humanity does get elevated back up to that level. And that's going to come when we rebuild the third temple and when everybody comes to know Hashem. And what is that going to mean to come to know Hashem? That's going to be where everybody is going to be on this same mission to get back to the level of Adam before the sin. Now, the Torah scholar is able to repair that and is able to do that with Torah and mitzvot. And we have Torah and mitzvot because the as people became more and more degraded and as people sinned more and more, you needed to have more and more mechanisms to bring light into the world and into the human soul. And that is why the Torah has 613 mitzvot and why the original mission by Adam was just not to eat from the tree. And why that is, because as the generations left, and as we had continuing degradation from the original creation, that we, in order to get back to this idea of perfection, of what is going to be the perfect person, we need Torah and Mitzvot in order to enable that. So... Hashem does repay his promises. One of the promises is that we will have the land back and we will have the temple back and Judaism will be the only religion left. Islam will go away. Christianity will disappear as it talks about in the prophets. All the other religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, those will all disappear. And everybody is going to be united in a single purpose and that is going to be in the knowledge of Hashem. Now, the Mishnah starts off and it says, if one repays a debt on the account of Shvius, the sages are pleased with him. And why is that? This is talking about where uh, somebody, uh, you know, the sages are considering it where, you know, it's proper for a person to repay a debt canceled by Shvius. So that, why? Because then, People who lend money will not be deterred to lend money again because, yeah, okay, Shvius might cancel loan, but if it's going to be the behavior of people to go a little bit above the halaha and to repay it, people will go out and lend the money and there'll be more access of capital to poor people. So the sages are pleased with this kind of person. Now, this is talking about the ideal way for a Jew to behave, the ideal way for a Jew to behave is, yes, this might be the halacha, but you're allowed for the sake of peace to go above the halacha. And in fact, in the Shita of the Yershami, and certainly with Rebbe, who put together the Mishnah, the idea is that if you go above and beyond the halacha, like in Shulcha Savedas, or you're going and you're repaying a debt where Shvius canceled it and you're going and you're repaying it anyway, and you're going above to create more peace, the sages are pleased with him. And there's a similar statement, and it says, if someone borrows from a convert whose son's converted with him and the convert dies, the halacha is going to be, the Mishnah says, he does not need to repay the convert's sons. But if he does repay them, the sages are pleased with him. Now, again, 
This is going to be because when you convert, all your family ties are legally severed, even the children's. And so they're not going to be legal heirs, even though they converted. So should a convert die before collecting what he is owed, there is no one who can claim the debt, and the debtor is therefore exempt from repaying the loan. Now, this is a little bit different. Children who are born to him from a Jewish woman after his conversion do inherit from him exclusively. This is talking about a Mishnah that this mission is talking about a convert who fathered a children after his conversion. And, you know, by denying that the children, you know, don't have an inheritance because of the conversion, what happens is a similar thing. And we get a chance where people will, you know, people will, will get demoralized and they may not want to convert. And so again, for the sake of peace, uh, the the way of the sages is going to be that you're going to even go above what is the halacha, that you're going to have extra chesed, extra kindness, extra mercy, and you are going to, for the sake of peace, because it encourages converts, and it encourages loans, and it encourages good behavior, to go above what the halacha is. It's a very advanced concept in Judaism, and this is one of the special things with the sages. In fact, when you go and you look in the Yerushalmi in Baba Metziah in chapter 2, in the laws of Shulcha Saveda, and there'll be a halacha where if a non-Jew loses something, that the Jew does not need to return it. And in fact, the, the only sugya there for that is going to be a case where the laundryman was uh, doing laundry, got a crown from a queen, and he didn't legally need to return it. This is the laundryman. And he returned it. And when we were studying this with Rabbi Horowitz and his Gemara Shir, because we had a special Gemara Shir that we were learning the Bavli and the Yershami as parallels, that he was saying that the fact that it doesn't give any other opinion means that the Yershami has this shrita, that this is really the way to behave. It's not, it's, it's above the halacha, but it's like the chesed thing to do. And uh, we have the same idea coming up over here. And that, yeah, legally you don't have to repay if, you know, you have a convert whose sons convert with him. And uh, you have over there where the convert dies. And, you know, normally what would happen is you'd have to repay the sons. But because, again, by the halacha, the, the family bond is severed when there's a conversion... You don't, legally, don't need to legally pay them. But the sages are happy if you do. And so really it's encouraging you to, for the sake of peace, to behave this way. There's a third example. Any movable property that can be acquired only by means of meshicha, this is going to be where you have one of the differences between land in the halacha and also movable property, and that's going to be where Land can be acquired by paying money, but a movable property has to be drawn close to him. He has to lift it or somehow acquire it by bringing it next to him. And this is called meshricha. And so this is talking about any movable property that can be acquired only by means of meshricha. And it says, but regarding... Uh, regarding whoever keeps his word, even when a formal act of Mishkicha was not performed, the sages are pleased with him. This is saying that even if he only gave his word without performing the act to acquire it, he should nevertheless keep his word. And the word for a Jew is very serious. You know, people underestimate in Judaism the value of the spoken word. It is with the spoken word that you can designate something as holy, that you can designate a sacrifice, that you can designate and marry a woman. It is with the spoken word that you can make an oath or a vow. It is with the spoken word that you can make something have kedusha when you separate trumos and maestros. It is with the spoken word that you can kill with lotion hara. 
Lotion Hara is a serious, serious thing. And also, when somebody gives their word, a Jew gives their word, and they don't keep their word, it's very serious because people are relying on you. And you can use this in business to steal the person's mind and to make him spend time and effort. And you ended up really stealing from this person. And Kodesh Baruch Hu will pay somebody very seriously for not keeping his word. And the Gemara says that, you know, what is the penalty for somebody not keeping an oath or a vow? One of the penalties is serious poverty because the tongue is very powerful. You are not an animal. An animal is has a tongue, but he doesn't have the intelligence to use it to make an oath or a vow or to, to get a wife or to separate something out to make it holy and to make a business arrangement and to make representations. But a Jew can, and a human being can, and that's why you have to have very accurate speech. And if you give your word, you have to keep an oral commitment. And this is talking about somebody who was giving his word, didn't make the acquisition yet by lifting it. And then it's talking about somebody who is um, reneging on his commitment. And it's very serious in Jewish law to renege on a commitment after there was a payment because somebody was already relying on you. They put their time into you. They put their effort into you. They believed you. They listened to your word. You even paid them a little bit to keep them motivated. And now to cancel a transaction after you've already made a deal with them and were paying, it's very, very serious. And if you are doing business on a daily basis, I encourage you to study the laws of business and transactions every day because if you are not, I promise you, you are stealing in your business. It has to be. And if you don't believe me, you can even look at the Hazanisha's book on Amuna and Bitachon, where he says the same thing. He says that somebody who is not studying the laws of business on a daily basis and doing business is stealing all the time. He is misrepresenting and stealing other people's time and the mind of the other person and in a way the soul of another person. And Kodesh Bar who will repay that measure for measure. You will descend into darkness and you will have a lot of problems here and in the world to come for business theft. In fact, one of the first things they ask you when you die is, were you honest in your business? And of course, everybody's going to say yes. But in fact, if you were not studying the laws of Hoshen Mishpat, which are the business laws in Jewish law, and again, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. It's what a Kodesh Baruch Hu thinks because the Torah and the mitzvot is a reflection of divine will. And... The idea is that that the the monetary law, the way it's supposed to be, is the way the Torah says it is. It's not your opinion of what you think is fair. So let's get into the next section. And the next section it was talking about in this Gemara, if one borrows from a convert. And the Gemara is going to present a cryptic statement that's going to elaborate on this. And we're going to get into this. And Rabbi Lazar says, as long as he returns it to the convert's children. And the Gemara wants to get an explanation for the statement. Rabbi Yose asks and says, what is the meaning of as long as he returns it to the convert's children? And the Gemara explains and says, if the convert has sons, the borrower returns the money only to the sons of the convert, but not to the daughters. However, if... The convert does not have sons. The borrower returns the money to the convert's daughters. So Rabbi Lazar is teaching that as long as the convert has children, even if he is survived only by daughters, the debt is to be returned to the daughters. 
And this is paralleling the biblical laws of inheritance, according to that where you have the sons inheriting exclusively and where the daughters uh, only inherit if there are no sons. So now I hear everybody in the world saying, oh, sexist, sexist. Not true. Why? Because when you're a daughter and you get married to a guy, that guy supports you and that guy's family supports you. So now when somebody uh, dies in this new family, your husband and you are getting their inheritance. So instead of getting your inheritance from your father, you're getting it from your husband's father. And so really you're just swapping this for that. You're not being excluded out of an inheritance in this case. You're just getting it from somewhere else. And in fact, it might be even more than you were going to get, depending on how you marry. Now, there are other laws of inheritance. And, you know, can women inherit uh, in Jewish law? Yes, they can. But again, we are talking about a Doraita thing, a biblical thing, where, again, the Torah itself is laying out a way where, uh, you know, when a woman gets married, she gets the inheritance from her father's family. And, and that, you know, the father gets it and the husband gets it. And, and uh, she's, you know, she shares the, um, you know, the wealth from, you know, her husband. They, they're a community and uh, a unit and, you know, family unit. And they, they, coll they collect it together. So this, again, is talking about the ideal. The ideal is that, you know, yeah, legally you don't have to repay this money, but you do it anyway. Igmar now explains the necessity of Rabbi Lazar's statement, uh, statement, and it's necessary to teach this so that you should not make a mistake and say that since inheritance of a convert is not applicable to Torah law, he should return the money only to the convert's sons. And if the convert has no sons, he doesn't need to return the money to the daughters. So Rabbi Lazar is teaching that this is actually not true, that if they have uh, no sons that you have to re repay the daughters. And that's that's what this is teaching. So this is really saying that if you're going to do this, go by biblical law and treat them with that kind of respect. Now, the Gemara is going to give a similar ruling. It's going to say, similarly, someone who died and he was the last of his father's family and he had no heir other than his mother, mother one, uh, one who had borrowed money from him, need not return the loan. But if he does return the loan to the mother of the deceased, the sages are pleased with him. This is talking about where uh, a case where, um, you know, you have a convert. And because, you know, every born Jew is a descendant of Jacob and related to every other uh, born Jew, in this case, only the Jewish relatives of the convert, uh, you know, if he if he had a mother, you know, who also uh, converted, would be um, related. But a mother does not inherit from the son, according to biblical law. But nevertheless, someone who returns such a loan is going to be praiseworthy. Why? Because non-Jews are accustomed to have the mother inherit her son's uh, product if or or inheritance if there are no other descendants and here too if you had the mother who converted with her son and being denied of an inheritance she might uh, lose her faith and therefore you know it's praiseworthy to repay the convert's loan to his mother and the Gemara presents a case where one should not accept an item that was returned. And the Gemara is, is actually a little bit surprising. It says, in the case of a thief who repented and now seeks to return a stolen article, if one accepts it from him, the sages are not pleased with him, for this may discourage other people from repenting. So let's say you have uh, someone who accepts payment for a stolen object. This is going to deter people from changing their evil ways. 
And the Gemara is going to be citing a case where, uh, it, you know, the ruling is a result of an incident that occurred in the times of Rebbe where a thief wished to repent, but he was dissuaded by his wife from doing so with the argument that if he repents and returns all, all of everything he stole, he'd be left with nothing of his own. So the sages are expressing their disapproval of someone who accepts the payment of a thief for a stolen object. Why? Because the Gemara is concluding that the actual stolen object is still the thief's possession and the victim uh, may accept it. But really what's, what's happening is you really want the thief to stop stealing. And that's good for everybody. And so really it's dissuading you from accepting it because they really want the tshuva. They want the thief to become a good citizen again. And whoever is going to basically take away all of the thief's property uh, and accept the repayment of it, then, you know, it's going to dissuade other people from repenting, like in the times of Rebbe, where the thief's wife is saying, don't repent because you won't have anything left. So in the final section of the Mishnah, it says, whoever keeps his word, the sages are pleased with him. Gamar is going to elaborate on business deals where there's no legal act of acquisition that gets performed. Rabbi Chia says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, regarding someone who performs a business transaction through oral commitments and then reneges on those commitments, sometimes you merely say that the sages are not pleased with him. And at other times you may say that he's handed over to a court uh, for a me shapara censure. Now, a mishapara is a formal censure that the court gives, and the official uh, statement of that is given in Baba Metzia in the Bavli 44a, and it says, one who exacted retribution from the people of the generation of the flood, he will exact retribution from someone who does not abide by his word. And the Gemara's phrasing is talking about the Mishapara statement. Why? Because it was robbery that that sealed the deal for the generation of the flood. They had a lot of sexual perversion. They were doing a lot of terrible things. But ultimately, what sent the rains? It was the robbery. Why? Because a Kodesh Bar who gives somebody property and gives somebody material. And when you are not satisfied with what you have and you go to try to take it from someone else, then it's like a denial of a Kodesh Baruch Hu and his providence in the world. It's like a statement that you went and and basically saying that Hashem didn't run the world right because he didn't give me enough. And that's not true. Hashem takes care of all of his creatures. And, you know... We have to we have to really stay away from robbery. One of the real serious sins in this world is robbery, and it's so serious that if you have blood on your hands from robbery, Hashem will not listen to your prayers. And we need Hashem to listen to our prayers for mercy. So theft is very serious, and that's why if you're doing business transactions with oral commitments and then you renege, uh, it's very very serious. And you are like somebody from the generation of the flood. And, you know, if no money has changed hands, the sages are merely displeased with the person who backs out of the deal. But if money actually did change hands and then you back out of the deal, you get this serious censure from the Bet Din. And what happens when the Bet Din gives you this Mishapara censure? Basically, it's sealing your fate that your prayers will not be answered anymore because you are in the category of somebody like in the generation of the flood who is guilty of robbery and you stole somebody's time and material and it's a denial that a Kodesh Baruch Hu is running the world. You know, we believe that we are our own power source. We believe that we make money by our work. And that's not true. The secret of this world is to see only a Kodesh Baruch Hu is the power source of this world. And only a Kodesh Baruch Hu gives out 
money and Parnassah. It's not from your hand. After the sin of Adam and Hava, it looks like Hashem put us into a world of concealment where there's a lot of material and degradation and a lot of Tuma in the world. The forces of Tuma make it so that it's very hard to detect and see the holiness of Hashem and holiness in this world. And it, it makes a, a screen over your eyes. And what's happening is that when you are denying that a Kodesh Baruch Hu runs the world and gives out Parnassah and is, you know, basically you're going to be resorting to theft, you are, you are not worthy of having your prayers answered because you have degraded so far, you've descended so far. And, you know, again, Kodesh Baruch Hu always keeps his word. Kodesh Baruch Hu gave his word to the Jewish people that we're going to have the land again. And as you can read in Ezekiel, that we're going to have the third temple. And Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't lie. People will, will lie. People will do business transactions where, God forbid, they back out and they misrepresent and they steal the person's mind. But Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't do that. And even more so, Kodesh Baruch Hu always pays for people who learn Torah. Learning Torah is the highest thing you can do. And a Kodesh Baruch Hu will give you immense blessing in your life here and in the world to come. And it's so much because you're going to be basically living a world of spirituality and a world where there's more divine providence and less concealment, both in this world and the world to come. So Rabbi Zera is going to continue clarifying the statement from Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Zera inquires from Rabbi Bahu and says, if he gave a gold coin as security, would that be the same as giving a ring? Sorry, Rabbi Zera quoted Rabbi Bahu, who says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, if someone gave a ring to his fellow as security and he wishes to renege on a commitment, he may renege without being subject to the Mi Shapara censure. And why would that be? Because the Gemara is going to explain that the prospective buyer expects the ring to stay intact. And it's really being given not as a payment, but as a record of an agreement. And it's different than giving a coin. Now, the sages are not happy in a case where somebody uh, you know, breaks an oral commitment and you know, lacks integrity by making a commitment and not keeping it. Now, in the case of giving a gold coin, it's different because uh, you know, the question is, would he be able to withdraw from a deal without this Mi Shapara censure, like in the case of the ring, or would we say that it's like he made a down payment and the down payment is the value of this gold coin? And Rabbi Zera says uh, that they said regarding the ring exclusively and not the gold coin. Gemara wants to know what's the difference. What is the difference between the gold coin and the ring? Gemara answers. The difference is that it is common for a gold coin to be given over as security to be converted into cash, but the ring stays intact. So again, the gold coin is being considered like a down payment, whereas the ring is being given as a memorial that the transaction occurred. And so again, the difference is going to be that the gold coin should get the Mishapara statement of robbery because there was a payment as part of this deal. Somebody paid part of this deal. There was a payment of a gold coin. And that's going to be the serious, the serious, serious thing where somebody makes a representation to do something in business, pays into it, and then reneges on the deal. And that is what's going to put you into the category of someone like in the flood for robbery, and why your prayers are not going to be answered. How do you repent from this? You have to repay your robbery. You have to repay it. You have to fix it. You have to make chuva for it, and you have to fix it with the person. And if you can't fix it with the person, you have to go repay the community. But you know, you do not want to have stolen money on your hands. And if you are doing business and you are not studying the laws of Hosh and Mishpat, you are stealing every day in your business. 
Now, somebody who withdraws from a business deal, uh, is it's very serious because somebody who makes a promise and then backs out, what is that? Human beings do that. Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't do that. Kodesh Baruch Hu gave the Torah as a tool to fix the creation. And we need the Torah as part of this tikkun to repair the world, to bring humanity back to a perfected state. And the only way to do that is with Judaism and the Torah and the mitzvot and getting into the details of the mitzvot. And every time you do a mitzvah, you are creating light in the world. And every time you make an avera, you are descending into darkness and creating darkness in the world. So the, the question continues. Rabbi Yaakov Barzavdi quotes Rabbi Abahu in the name of Rabbi Yochanan and says that if uh, somebody was to give a gift to a fellow and he wants to renege on the commitment, he may renege on it. But the Gemara is going to object. Rabbi Yose met Rabbi Yaakov Barzavdi. And Rabbi Yose asked him and says, uh, is this correct that, uh, is this, is that, you know, the correct no and the correct yes? In other words, that is somebody allowed to break his promise on a gift? It's a very circuitous way to ask it, but basically he's asking, how can it be that he's allowed to, to break his promise? That he's basically saying, yes, he's making a promise, and now he's saying, no, he's not keeping his promise. And Rabbi Yaakov Barzavdi replies, and he says to them, in this case, at the time he said he would give a gift, it was a correct yes, and in later circumstances it changes. It caused him to retract his offer. And the Gemara cites a dissenting opinion. Rav disagrees with Rabbi Yaakov Barzavdi. And Rav says, when I tell the members of my household to give somebody a present, I do not renege on my commitment under any circumstances. Rav is saying, one should not renege on an oral commitment, even if the circumstances change. So now you might be saying, wait a second, but what about my business? Things change all the time. You need to be more careful with your speech. You need to guard your tongue more carefully because the universe is built the way it is. And it's built in a way where if a Jew reneges on an oral commitment, you will see serious degradation in your life. And in a way, it's like you're giving an oath or like making a vow. And what will happen when you break an oath and a vow? You will descend into poverty, says the Gemara. Now, the Gemara is going to look at the view of Rav. And the following Brisa contradicts Rav. It says, when did they say that movables are required through Mishkicha? And this, by the way, is a Tesefet in Kiddushin 1.5. And the Gemara says, when they are resting in a public domain or in a courtyard, that is the property of neither of them. Neither the buyer nor the seller owns the courtyard. However, if movables are, are resting in the buyer's domain, then once the seller has accepted upon himself to sell it, the buyer acquires, acquires the movables without mishkicha. In other words, we have a law that if you know something's in a house or a courtyard, that the house and the courtyard can acquire it for them. So if the seller is making a deal, and even though the buyer does not pick up the item, the courtyard acquires it for him. That's what it's saying. So Gamar continues, says, if the movables are in the seller's domain, the buyer does not acquire them until he lifts them up or until he draws out everything from the seller's domain. But if the movables are located in the domain of one with whom they have been deposited, the buyer does not acquire them. And that's going to be until the custodian acquires them for the sake of the buyer or until the custodian rents out their place to the buyer. So in the last ruling of this price, it's teaching that a transaction is not final until there's a formal act of acquisition that is performed on the buyer's behalf. And as we see in Rob's ruling, 
that the benefactor may not retract a gift because the recipient has already acquired it. In other words, in Rav's case, the members of Rav's household are going to be where uh, they've already distributed the gift, and now the recipient has gained ownership over it. So now that's going to be a big problem because ownership has actually transferred. How do you take it back? In this other case about being in a courtyard that's a neutral courtyard, you actually have to have an act of kinyan. It has to be an act of acquisition. And without an act of acquisition, uh, it's going to be where uh, the gift was not transferred yet. So the Gemara is going to include uh, with a question. It's going to say, what does Rav do with this price? And he's going to answer it. He's going to say that here, where Rav is stating that he would not renege after instructing his household to give a present, he refers to a case where he stood uh, the recipient with him. In other words, that's going to be a case where he acquires the gift when the benefactor tells the member of the household to give it to the recipient. And here the Brisa is referring to a case where the seller did not stand with the buyer with him. In this case, the formal act of acquisition, uh, it doesn't happen because the buyer does not acquire the object until the custodian goes and, and does it with him. So the Gemara is going to support the answer. It's going to say you should know that it is true because a certain person deposited security for salt and before it was delivered, the salt became more expensive. So the seller wanted to withdraw from the deal. And he came before Rav to ask if he's allowed to withdraw from the commitment. Rav said to him, either give him the salt equal to the value of his entire security or the buyer can hand you over for a mishapara. In other words, that Rav is saying that, you know, give him the salt, which was given as a security, and that's down payment, or, you know, go for mishapara because, uh, you know, you're, you're basically uh, stealing. You've backed, you've paid into a transaction, and very nice that the transaction went the other way, and the value of what you were selling went up and you would like to go sell it to someone else, but you are going to be considered to be like a robber and you're, you know, you should be handed over for somebody like a robber for that statement to be said against you by the bet din, which puts you into the category of someone like in the flood and in the time just before the flood where the robbery was very serious. The Gemara continues, says, the view of Rav is apparently reversed, and that's where he says as follows, when I tell the members of my household to give someone a present, I did not renege on my commitment, and he said that this ruling that the buyer does not fully acquire any of the salt, it must therefore be true that when Rav instructs his household not to break a commitment, he's referring to where all three parties are standing together, and this is not the case with regarding to the salt. And that's going to be the commentary by the Vilna Gon on it. The Gemara is going to ask the question differently and refute the proof. And it says there he was referring to the strict law where he permitted the seller to retract. And the way in which Rav conducted himself and his instructions to the household was that he would not renege on any commitment. And that's out of piety. And the Vilna Gon is going to say about this that according to this conclusion, the Gemara is going to depart from the original thinking that Rav holds that though a promise, uh, through a promise, the recipient legally acquires the object, Rav is agreeing with Rabbi Yochanan that one may break a promise to give a present, and in his own business dealings, however, Rav is acting beyond the letter of the law, and as noted, the prospective giver would still be considered lacking integrity through breaking the commitment. And if the value of the promised gift was relatively small, it's going to be uh, lacking integrity. But uh, it should be noted that, you know, you really should not be retracting on a gift. And certainly in uh, business dealings, if you have a case where the transaction went the other way on you and the price of what you were selling went up and somebody else is getting the benefit instead of you, but you've already paid into it. You've already put a deposit and a down payment. And and now the transaction went the other way on you. You should keep your word. 
and you should finish the transaction even though it's not in your favor. Why? Because the commitment and the word of a Jew is very powerful. And that's why you have to be so serious about Losh Nahara and serious about learning business law so that you can tour a business law so that you can do your transactions in a way that fits with the Torah values so you are not going to be in the category in Shemayim as a robber or a thief because your prayers will not be answered and you will descend. You will descend in holiness and you will descend away from the ideal of what a human being is supposed to do. And as you go down and degrade, the amount of conceal the amount of concealment that Hashem has when you try to look and perceive Hashem, it only gets more and more hidden. And every time you do an Avera like robbery, a Kodesh Baruchu becomes more and more hidden from you. Why? Because you are descending in this material world and you are getting deeper and deeper and further and further away from the original source and the only source. And it's a compounding. That's why when you do Torah and Mitzvot, if you are honest in your business transactions, you can start to climb up the ladder of holiness so that you will see Kodesh Baruch Hu in your life more. And every time you do a, a mitzvah, you will see Kodesh Baruch Hu more. There will be less concealment. Why? Because you are ascending in the creation. You are ascending up to how Kodesh Baruch Hu originally envisioned how a human being is supposed to be in this creation. And so we should be more pious. And one of the deep ideas here is that a Kodesh Baruch Hu gave his word that this will be the land of the Jews. And all of these laws with Shvius are going to be deraita. The laws are forever. There is no take backs, right? Children have that. Oh, we do take backs and we can cancel there. And in theological terms, it's called abrogation. It's one of the differences between Judaism and Islam. In Islam, they'll say that there can be abrogation. And in Judaism, there is no such thing as abrogation. God's word is permanent and his promises is permanent. Why? Because the creation has to go a certain way. And the Jews have to bring back humanity back to the original creation of Adam and Chava and to live in a world of spirituality with the knowledge of Hashem. Have a great day.